When a computer is powered on, what happens? Well, if you hit it a few times, a popcorn kernel pops, which would turn a few gears. Then the gears become sentient. Then pray that all of the problematic influencers will just disappear, which would basically make the world start spinning all over again. And then your computer screen pops on. Just kidding, that's not the only thing that happens. A power on self test will happen, ensuring that all the hardware components are up to standard, such as the CPU, the device drivers, etc. The BIOS, which stands for Basic Input and Output System, or the UEFI, Unified Extended extensible firmware interface embedded into your motherboard's ROM chip. Find some bootable devices, then within that bootable device, find the first sector. And in the first sector of the master boot record, there's typically a simple program called the bootloader. The bootloader would be loaded into random access memory or volatile memory, then properly interpreted. The bootloader will load K-Main or a main kernel program, which will load all of the main system components, such as designated memory for the operating system, a file system, device drivers, a user space and interface, etc. Before we continue, a good point to note is that the boot process was designed to be a simple procedure like this for a reason. We need to make sure everything is safe before moving on to the next step. Business. I went to college! A kernel initialization process is usually started at this point. This is the main process that will be running at all times. Yes, when you think about it, when we manage processes, every user space process is a child process of this main process we're talking about. Kernel processes will be spawned independently for designated tasks such as scheduling, memory management, device drivers, and any network or file system operations. A good analogy might be that these kernel processes that we're talking about are the tech crew behind a Broadway show yeah. and the user space child processes we're talking about are the actors in that show. So I've mentioned the user space a couple of times now, so what the hell is that? In the most precise way, the user process is a portion of memory where non-kernel processes and applications are all run. This is where web browsers and games, for example, might run. Let's say that you're living in a house and a delivery person has a package for you, but you don't remember purchasing any package. No. The person asked to come inside for a signature, which seemed like a pretty major red flag, and it all seemed pretty weird. So you just reject the delivery person and the package and lock your door. The kernel is where everything that's vulnerable exists. It's also where the brain is, where everything is decided about the machine. And it makes these decisions based on all the information it has access to. You probably know what a typical Amazon driver and delivery would look like. You'll probably accept the Amazon package, but not the package from the strange delivery yeah, driver. Right. The kernel takes precautions about network operations, updates and changes before it actually applies them, considering all of the relevant information. Whenever you download a game, you're retrieving an executable of some kind from the internet from God knows where. And this executable wants to make changes to your machine. And that doesn't mean that this executable is a kernel process either. In fact, it isn't at all. It would technically be a user space process that would ask the kernel processes nicely if it can make some changes to the machine. These requests are usually very specific API calls to the kernel. These are called system calls. These system calls can be as simple as opening a file from flash memory. It could also be something networking related, like starting a web server or client, which would be called a socket. Let's dive deeper into some specific components of the kernel. Let's start with memory. For starters, let's clarify some things. Random access memory versus read-only memory. Non-volatile memory, such as read-only memory or flash memory, is memory that is stored permanently. The difference between them is flash memory can be edited or erased electronically. And then read-only memory as well, read-only. For example, executables or files saved in your system documents folder would be considered flash memory, whereas read-only memory would be the bootloader we mentioned earlier. Non-volatile memory is permanent. It uses configurations of transistors that would remain in the same state until you change them. Random access memory or volatile memory is memory that is stored with an electrical circuit. If you're unfamiliar with circuits, circuits can remember binary data by recognizing electrical signals as on or off, and usually this is contained within a memory cell. And this memory can be stored temporarily on a chip. This is why it's called volatile. Everything will be flushed out and forgotten when you turn off your computer. Think of read-only memory as a library of books, and then random access memory is like your short-term memory and your own thoughts in general. Now that we know what memory actually is, let's look into the magical memory, also known as virtual memory, which is a bit of an oxymoron. It's just as real as any other memory. It's all it's just, all an, just illusion. an illusion. Let's start with the process. 
From the CPU's perspective, we don't know exactly how much memory we might use yet. A virtual address space is usually assigned, which can be accessed from a page table that is dedicated to a process. What's a page table? It's a data structure that contains contiguous entries. These entries can be thought of as a struct containing a pointer that is initially set to null, but is ultimately dedicated to be set to a memory frame in RAM. Each page table memory is mapped to a virtual memory page. How can the virtual memory page map to the entry? The memory management unit. Think of the MMU as a librarian trying to help you find a book from a catalog. The catalog has a virtual page number or VPN that corresponds to a page table entry. Think of the VPN as a key in a map structure and the value is a page table entry. The lookup would be very fast then. Each virtual memory page can contain a number of variables and data structures contiguously since it is essentially a fixed size block dedicated to the process. The number of memory pages dedicated to the process is heavily dependent on how much virtual memory the process might need. If the process ends up exceeding the number, the OS can swap out some of the inactive pages to be active for the process. Let's talk more about inactive versus active page tables. This is really important since this is how we can take a finite amount of space and make it magically appear as if there's more memory available. Page tables are organized into a hierarchical paging system. At the top, there's a dedicated page directory that is always in RAM. The page directory is responsible for pointing to page tables which are considered secondary level in the hierarchical paging system. The page directory is a similar structure as the page table itself in that it's a contiguous block of entries. However, it doesn't contain any page table entries. It contains pointers to other page tables that can be either active or inactive. The page directory is an index of all page tables that the OS is using except for the page tables that are swapped out to disk due to not being used for an extended period of time. Some of these page tables might be completely empty, but it's useful to have these in the page directory in case if we need to use them for a process. So what is meant exactly by being swapped? Some inactive or empty page tables might be sent to disk in case if we are running out of room in RAM. They could be later grabbed if we need them. And sometimes the swapping can be determined by a least recently used algorithm if we don't have a lot of RAM. However, this isn't ideal since there's a lot of overhead to grab from disk. So it's best just to put page tables there unless we absolutely have to. This is why we keep everything in RAM if we can, even empty page tables. Virtual memory is seemingly created by magic, but it's actually all managed within physical memory, always in a safe and efficient manner. I've always heard that everything is a file in Linux, but is actually. A good distinction to cover first is the difference between a memory block and a file. Memory blocks are typically referred to as volatile memory and RAM, whereas files are permanently stored on disk. And then sometimes data can have a hybrid experience where some of it might be loaded in RAM, but the file is really large, so you have to solely load it in bits and pieces. Every file yeah. has an inode, which serves as an index or a unique identifier. Inodes also store essential information mm -hmm. about the file but not the actual data. The metadata I'm talking about includes the file size, the file owner and group, the file permissions, time information like when it was created, and block pointers. These pointers point to the actual data of the file. Inodes are scattered across the disk or storage device. When the kernel is mounting our file system, every file is all over the place initially. And during mounting, the kernel doesn't actually physically move inodes around. Instead, it builds a logical directory entry tree in memory or RAM. However, a key distinction here is that the directory entry tree Do I does not contain inodes themselves. It contains its own struct that has a file name and a pointer to the actual inode, which would contain the real data on disk. In the end, we have a tree that represents a file system when the kernel finishes mounting. Another key distinction here is that the entries never copy anything. They are simply pointers to the real information on disk. So the file system tree is always really lightweight. To bring this all together, let's revisit the steps that happen when you turn on your computer. First, the bootloader process begins. The kernel initializes, meaning the kernel takes over and initializes essential system parts. We can access these components before we mount the file system because of compression and decompression. Then we do the root file system mounting. We start the init process, which is responsible for starting essential system services and user environments, like a graphical desktop. I really hope you guys learned something today. Bye.